In the 1880s, the United States is, is a very wealthy country. Large cities like New York, Boston, um, are essentially defenseless. And those in the Navy who are trying to make an argument that there should be a powerful U.S. Navy talk about European powers as possible enemies. Uh, there's still a very strong sentiment of uh, anti-British attitude. Uh, remember that we fought the British in 1812. Uh, also, we worried about the fact that uh, some of the South Americans were more powerful than we were. Uh, Brazil had bought some new battleships and uh, we had nothing to match. There was a sense that uh, the United States was a rich prize waiting to fall into someone's hands. Despite the president's fears of invasion, the Congress was against building battleships, favoring the preservation of the nation's fiercely isolationist stance. A US naval captain, Alfred Mahan, would dramatically change this mindset. In his classic book of 1890, the influence of sea power upon history, Mahan traced the rise and fall of maritime powers. He demonstrated that the nation which controlled the seas controlled its own fate, and those lacking in naval mastery were doomed. Specifically in his book, he argued that if one had a choice between developing sea power and land power, that a, that a country was well advised to develop sea power because the return on investment was higher. And Mahan believed that any number of countries had this potential. It wasn't just a, it wasn't just a case of Great Britain, but also France, possibly Germany, but especially his own country, the United States. Mahan made a dramatic suggestion. The United States should build an offensive rather than defensive navy comprising an enormous fleet of battleships. If the United States is to prevent Europeans from burning down American cities, which is the fear that we had at that time, it has to be able to put its fleet where they are. We defend the United States elsewhere, not in the United States. Mahan's forceful ideas helped persuade Congress to build an ocean-going fleet. In less than two decades, the United States would boast the second largest navy in the world, comprising 17 battleships and 24 cruisers. Ships like the 6,000-ton cruiser USS Olympia, commissioned in 1893, were a coming of age for the US Navy and for the country's stature as an industrialized nation. By government decree, every aspect of the ships from their rivets to their armor and heavy turreted guns were to be manufactured at home, pushing the nation's industrial capabilities to new limits. The decision to build an ocean-going battle fleet marked a radical shift in how the United States saw its position in the world and how it was prepared to act. In late 1897, Washington received reports of a rebellion in the Spanish colony of Cuba over demands for independence. In December, the president dispatched the battleship Maine on a so-called friendly visit to Havana. Its mission, to ensure the well-being of US citizens living there and assert the nation's emergence as a naval force. Two months later, the Maine was destroyed in Havana Harbor by two massive explosions. Two hundred and fifty-two men were killed in the disaster. For the first time, the tragic consequences of the loss of a battleship were captured on the new medium of the motion picture. For the American public, potent images of their nation's first blooding in the dangerous game of gunboat diplomacy.
The reason for the catastrophe was later traced to an explosion in the battleship's internal magazines. But at the time, the US Navy concluded a Spanish mine most likely sank the ship. American popular opinion turned strongly in favor of retribution against Spain. In a matter of months, America would go to war by sea for the first time in its history. In late April 1898, Secretary for the Navy Theodore Roosevelt dispatched US warships to Cuba and other parts of the Spanish Empire. Commodore George Dewey commanded the Asiatic Squadron. Aboard his flagship Olympia, he set sail for the Spanish colony of the Philippines. At dawn on the 1st of May, Dewey's crew sighted a small squadron of Spanish gunboats anchored in Manila Bay. In less than six hours, the Spanish ships were annihilated. News of the United States Navy's first victory at sea was greeted with national approval and thrust future President Theodore Roosevelt into the national spotlight. Over the next three months, the US Navy backed up the nation's troops as they captured the Spanish colonies of the Philippines, Guam and islands of the Caribbean. With its modest fleet of battleships and cruisers, America entered a select club of empire builders and emerged as a new world power. The arrival of the US Navy on the world's oceans would, in time, cause concern for Britain. But as the century turned, the small island nation seemed impervious to any hostile power. Her wealth and independence came from the largest empire in history. One quarter of the world's land and people were ruled by Queen Victoria and jealously guarded by her all-powerful fleet. But for most of the previous century, Europe had been a boiling cauldron of militarism. Border after border was drawn and redrawn in blood. As Europe's old nations crumbled, new ambitious empire builders emerged. And to consolidate their colonial ambitions, kings and emperors looked to the battleship. As the navies of Europe expanded, Britain guaranteed funding to the Royal Navy to maintain a battle fleet greater than the next two most powerful navies combined. Whether the country could sustain the enormous costs involved, however, was in serious doubt. By 1900, British industry and the economy were suffering a downturn. To make matters worse, a new industrial nation was emerging. A nation that dreamt of building battleships to challenge Britain's control of the seas. That burgeoning powerhouse of industry was the new United German Republic, ruled by Kaiser Wilhelm II. It was only natural for a nation like Germany to wish to be a global power. She was a rising industrial state. There was nothing which said that Britain had a, a natural right to be uh, the unrivaled world power. If you wanted to expand economically and strategically, then you had to go to sea. Four decades earlier, in January 1859, a 101-gun salute heralded Wilhelm's birth. 
the news was greeted with enthusiasm in Britain, especially by Queen Victoria. Wilhelm was the Queen's first grandchild, born to her daughter, Princess Victoria, and future German Emperor, Prince Frederick. From an early age, Wilhelm's obsession was with the sea and ships. As a boy, he holidayed with his English cousins and visited the giant shipbuilding and naval centre at Portsmouth. Wilhelm's visits to the United Kingdom always placed before him the primacy of the Royal Navy in British society, politics and economy, the importance of the fleet uh, when it came to Britain's premier role in the world at the time. This was drilled into the Kaiser from first-hand experience, from his earliest personal experiences as a child. On the one hand, uh, Queen Victoria was his grandmother, and in, in many ways he seems to have loved her. And he was always uh, very proud of wearing the uh, uniform of a Brit British Admiral of the Fleet. And he admired the British and their achievements in building up uh, the greatest navy of the world at that time. On the other hand, uh, he also thought that it would be necessary for Germany to follow the British example to build ships to conquer the world. The great Prussian tradition that Germany had inherited, however, was not seamanship, but soldiery. With the most powerful army in the world, the German parliament, the Reichstag, saw no purpose in building a battle fleet. But a maverick naval captain serving in the high command, Alfred Tirpitz, shared the Kaiser's dream. What brings Tirpitz to the Kaiser's attention is a memo that Tirpitz writes. It suggests something that has since become called the risk theory. In essence, it's this, that the Germans can indeed provide a major threat to the British Grand Fleet, the British Royal Navy. How is this possible, short of massive numbers, short of prohibitive investments? Well, it's possible in this way. You can provide the Royal Navy with a major threat in its own backyard. And furthermore, you don't have to equal them in numbers or firepower. What you need to do is provide a sufficient risk so that if the British did engage you, the price would be so enormous for them to pay, both in, in preparation and in losses in battle, that they would be reluctant to, to take that step of direct engagement in a decisive battle, because it might cost them their sea supremacy. And of course, Tippett himself provides the Kaiser with the rationale and the selling power to say we should build a fleet, we can build a fleet, we can make the British think twice before checking our economic progress or our military progress. The Kaiser was so taken by the daring strategy, he promoted Tirpitz to Secretary for Naval Affairs. <laughs> 